Um, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the kind introduction, Melanie. Um, first of all, uh, it's a real pleasure to be finally in Vienna, this beautiful and uh, fabled city and uh, university. And in fact, um, Vienna is, is even more beautiful than I had expected. <laughs> and um, aside from the fact of uh, inviting me here, I think the organizers uh, chose uh, well in choosing uh, Myanmar. It's a very good case study for the uh, topic and the issue of this conference. And um, it used to be said in the medical world that uh, if a specialist or a professor of medicine says that a patient has a very interesting condition, it most likely means that the condition is incurable. <laughs> I hope that's not the case for my country, Myanmar. So after the uh, very uh, interesting and lively opening panel we had yesterday, um, this is the chance, I think, uh, for me and for all of you to have a different view, and that is the view from the ground, so to speak, and from the national and the sub-national levels. I hope it will give you a more complete picture of what uh, we are going to deliberate about. So, the country uh, called Myanmar, it used to be called Burma in the past. You know? um, the literature is pretty sound on the fact of a resource-rich country being beset by a multitude of ills. Uh, but Myanmar stands out in that this situation has persisted for over 60 years. And for us, for as long as one could remember, it was part of the gospel that Myanmar is rich in natural resources, but underdeveloped. Therefore, resources have to be utilized and harnessed to develop the country and help it become a modern country. So even during the colonial period, I think we were well known in being the world's uh, f biggest uh, exporter of rice and the source of the best teak wood in the world. We had uh, petroleum as well and many valuable minerals. Um, in those days, there were big mines you know, uh, that produced uh, lead, silver, zinc, and also tungsten, which were very important in the munitions industry. And so, for many decades, even following independence, it was widely accepted that the country had great potential, you know, and we only needed the expertise, you know, the capital and the technology to develop it. But in reality, it has become a very different uh, picture, as you will see. Resource extractivism became rampant following the popular rising, uprising of 1988 against the authoritarian one-party state. It's uh, kind of ironic in a way. Now people are saying that at least under the dictator, Ne Win, who has been um, dead for some years now, he did conserve the forests. You know? It's only after he fell that everybody, um, the whole country was let open and the environmental pillaging began. The economy was partly opened up after 1988, while political control remained. It was a very dangerous situation. With the imposition of sanctions from the West and Myanmar's political and economic isolation, the field was laid open, so to speak, to domestic businesses in collusion with the junta and interests from neighboring countries, particularly China. The new class of what we call crony capitalists accumulated their wealth and political influence through unfettered extraction of resources. Investment from two neighboring energy and resource-hungry countries, China and Thailand, exacerbated the situation. For the political and business establishment, which is still very strong, this cozy relationship with East Asian economic growth and development would have continued to flourish had it not been for civil society voices speaking out. With the elections of 2010, and the expansion of political and media space, the outcry has spread significantly to popular movements, particularly of smallholder farmers. There is intense interest continuing from a big neighbor like China, which aspires to great power status, although it has been forced to trim its sales in the new ambience. Um, Myanmar's manufacturing and service industries are still in the initial stages, and so much of the national economy is still dependent upon natural resources. But by being a late starter, 
Myanmar's position is such that a significant and far-reaching choice on the development tra trajectory can still be made, unlike neighboring Thailand, for instance, which has lost most of its resources up to now. However, Myanmar still lacks the political will and perhaps even the capacity to arrive at such a decision. The challenges and setbacks of the political transition, which you probably see in the news every time, still takes precedence, and state capacity and implementation are weak. There will be national elections next year, which means that an issue like resource extractivism can be put on election platforms, but an effort will still be required to do this. And on top of that, the promised advent of federalism, as you well know, Myanmar is very much an um, ethically diverse country, and there was the promise of federalism at independence, which has never been realized, and which has led to so much uh, civil conflict. The promised advent of federalism could result in decentralized control of resources. However, a system for resource sharing still remains to be worked out, and the risk of potential conflict of resources is a real one. As for more equitable social redistribution of benefits, you also realize that Myanmar still remains um, a least developed country, a status which was conferred in 1988-87. It is a sad commentary on the revival of democracy that hardly any attention has been paid to it, what I mean by the uh, social redistribution of benefits by both the government and the opposition. Control over the extraction and use of natural resources is pervaded by corruption and armed might. It will take time and effort for laws and regulations to be imposed, if ever. The new multi-party bicameral parliament, with which I work quite a bit, by the way, has been passing legislation on resources, notably land. The name environmental conservation has been added to that of the Ministry of Forests. However, implementation and regulation are still weak. Currently, my organization, as Melanie has said, is undertaking public consultations on a draft national land use policy, perhaps the first time such a process is being carried out in Myanmar. Myanmar is also home to what can be called the longest running civil war in the world, having started shortly after independence in 1948. What started out as ideological and ethnic-based rebellions have over time partly gravitated to conflicts over activities like logging and mining. In other words, um, the civil war is being fueled by the sale, uh, the illegal sale of uh, natural resources. And besides armed conflicts per se, disputes, protests and struggles stemming from land confiscation are now widespread all over the country. And as if the resource curse in its many dimensions were not enough, Myanmar's geographical position also makes it an arena for the resurgent big power rivalry in East Asia. Being China's outlet to the Indian Ocean adds immeasurably to its strategic value. Myanmar has um, active environmental civil society organizations which have taken up the issue of resource extractivism. There exist working relationships with uh, social scientists who are mostly from abroad, but more needs to be done. There can be no better example than an event like this, you know, where um, activists you know, and uh, academia and social scientists uh, get together and try to find a uh, resolution of all the pressing problems. I will be very interested in having uh, the findings that we will have tomorrow so that I can take back and share with um, stakeholders and uh, policymakers in my own country. And uh, finally, I would like to say that uh, Myanmar being the case study that <coughs> it is, and in its, like I said, uh, late starter position, any um, initiative, the kind of things that were mentioned yesterday as well, that can be um, worked out, you know, Myanmar would be a very good uh, venue or location for, let's say, testing these out. You know. um, Again, like, unlike other countries in the region, other ASEAN countries, who are now firmly upon the, uh, what we can call the uh, neoliberal development path, Myanmar still has time to make this choice. 
although I would say that we are still, we are very much in a uh, very uh, <coughs> desperate position. The kind of uh, developmental state that was able to bring about so much, uh, well, change, like not South Korea, for instance, you know, has been very attractive. But uh, again, we don't have the kind of intellectual resources that uh, South Korea has, and not the kind of political will either. Uh, we have over 60 political parties, I think about 69, but um, they are only political parties mostly in name, you know, so they don't have the capacity to even to, uh, to formulate you know, and to push through policies. Uh, the President Angie's policy that uh, we are discussing has been put together with a lot of um, inputs and help from donor organizations. You know? So what do you say about donor organizations? We still uh, need their assistance. Um, on the larger picture, I would say that uh, although we've had so much conflict, ideological as well, right now in Myanmar, I mean, ideology is off the map. You know, nobody's much interested in ideology. For the ordinary people, it's very much a matter of worrying where the next meal comes from, living hand to mouth, uh, so to speak. For the elite, it's about getting rich as much as possible in the shortest possible time. So it's a very incongruous solution, which I'm sorry to say, democracy has not been the solution as expected. So I come again to well, inputs from events like this and from people like you. I'm very glad that some postgraduate students from here will be coming to Myanmar and they'll be able to share the research findings with the rest of the country. Um, many people, including my organization in Myanmar and the stakeholders, are overstretched. You know. There is the realization that there's a desperate need to search for answers, you know. but they're not forthcoming. So I think um, the next two or three years will be very critical, whether we can make the right choices and the decisions that will put us on a more favorable trajectory, or will we follow the path of other countries in the region, notably like Cambodia, for instance, you know, which has become kind of a developmental disaster, as you know. So that's why I see the value of being able to attend such events like this, and these kind of inputs will also be very valuable for our country. So I've been uh, instructed to talk only about, for about um, 20 minutes, and uh, I will be having to cover quite a bit of ground, and so I'll be quite happy after this to feel any of the questions that you might have. Thank you very much.